Hello there. This little video is a basic introduction to shutter speed, what it is and what effect it has on the images you take. This video is part of my technical basics fundamentals course, which is building week by week into an entire beginner's course in photography to teach you all the fundamental technical bits you need to know so that you can start taking better pictures. I'm posting videos once a week on Friday afternoon. If you subscribe, of course, you'll find out about them straight away. If you like what I'm doing, stick a like down there and please stick a comment below if I've missed something or you want clarification on something, I'll do my very best to answer it. Meanwhile, get stuck into everything you need to know about shutter speed. The next exposure control I want to talk about is the shutter. Now, like aperture, it's essentially very, very simple. All a shutter does is cover up or expose the image sensitive device within your camera. Now, in the old fashioned days, like this thing, that would have been film. Nowadays, of course, it's a sensor of some sort. It's a CCD, a CMOS, um, it's a digital chip rather than a piece of film. And that's all a shutter does. It literally doesn't let any light in, lets all the light in. Where, of course, they get sophisticated is in how long they're open for. Okay, on the top of this old camera, you can see an actual range of shutter speeds and you would mechanically shift through them to choose how fast the shutter's going to be. And it's the duration of how long it lets the light through that is your shutter speed. Okay, now here's a good example. This is an old fashioned FM2, an old fashioned film camera. If I open the back of it, you can see right through the camera there. Okay, wind us on. And I'm currently set for one second shutter speed. If I press the shutter now, you will see the shutter go up and close. Okay, it was open for precisely one second. By comparison, I'm gonna whack the shutter speed dial all the way around to the fastest shutter speed this camera will do, which is one four thousandth, one four thousandth even, of a second. Okay, now you didn't actually see the blades open there. You'd have seen the move, but you would not have seen the period during which it was open and exposing the, well in this case, the film, but the sensor. So if we go to somewhere in the middle, let's call it a quarter of a second. Okay. You could tell that there was a gap there about, about a quarter of a second during which the film would have been exposed. Now, this is similar to the shutter that you get on modern DSLRs. Um, camera phones and similar things don't use this. As you can imagine, this is quite a large thing to be shoved into something small like a camera phone. The way shutters work on things like camera phones without getting into enormous detail that won't help is effectively uh, in camera phones and video cameras, the shutter is controlled by the computer within the camera simply turning the sensor on or off for a certain period of time. Okay, it's a, again, it's a fairly simplistic device, but it's not the same as this mechanical thing. Okay, but effectively, that's all a shutter is. Okay, it lets light through, doesn't let light through. Simple as that. So once again, very, very simply, here is one second as the shutter goes through. Okay. And here is something like, let's call it 1,000th of a second, fairly fast. Okay, easy as that. So here I'll show you nice and clearly how a shutter functions. Again, we're using an old fashioned film camera here, but the principles are exactly the same. If I open the back of the camera so you can see right through, so, Obviously this is where film would have sat, but this is where your sensor would be. I can't open uh, a DSLR to show you the sensor, so we'll have to do it this way. Wind the camera on, and let's set the shutter speed for one second. And now watch the shutter, opens, closes for precisely one second, okay? So the light sensitive thing that will be back here, in this case film, but in your case, um, a sensor of some sort, was exposed for precisely one second. If we roll around, let's go all the way, let's go to 60th of a second, see what that gives us. And fairly brief, but you saw a, a flash there of, of light as a 60th of a second worth of light came through. Let's push this all the way to the fastest speed this camera will go, which is one four thousandth of a second. And okay, you might just have glimpsed some white there. What this will also do is we'll actually shoot in what's called bulb mode, which means the shutter stays open as long as I hold my finger on the shutter. So I'm going to open it. I can, obviously now you can appreciate light is coming through to hit whatever light sensitive medium we're using. I'll take my finger off, shutter closes. That's it, simple as that. Right, so there's the absolute basics of how a shutter works. 
it's, as we say, a blind that opens and closes and lets light in over a designated period of time. The longer it's open, the more light gets in. The shorter it's open, the less light gets in. Okay, got that? Now, just like with aperture, there's a number sequence and the sequence relates to itself. Okay, the common numbers you'll find, we're going to come on in a later video to why you see some intermediary numbers. You'll find numbers going from one second, half a second, quarter, eighth of a second, one fifteenth, thirtieth, one sixtieth, one one hundred and twenty fifth, one two fiftieth, one five hundredth, and on and on up the scale. Down this end, these are slow shutter speeds, like one second, where the shutter is open for a long period of time. And up this end, these are fast shutter speeds, short, you know, there's only a very short duration during which the shutter is open. Now this number sequence, these sort of main numbers you'll see in the shutter speed sequence, represent, just like Aperture did, now go back to last week's video if this is confusing you, they represent one stop. Remember a stop is a basic unit of exposure, one stop between each of these numbers. Okay, so between half a second and a quarter of a second is one stop, between 1 2 50th and 1 2 5 is one stop. Now just like Aperture, okay, there is at least some logic to this, as you change you are letting in half as much light or twice as much light, depending on which direction you are going. So, if you decrease the shutter speed, if you make the shutter speed shorter, you let in half as much light. So if you go from 1 15th of a second to 1 30th, that's one stop. That is half as much light getting in, okay, because it's open for only half the time. And, hopefully you're with me, if you go in the other direction, you are letting in twice as much light. So if you go from 500th of a second, to 1 2 50th of a second, you let in twice as much light, which is one stop, because the shutter's open for a longer period of time. Okay, make sure you've got that on board, because that is basically how the shutter works as it relates to exposure. Okay, so very, very quickly, if you're going in this direction, you're getting faster, you're letting less light in. Okay, and as you go up each stop, you're letting half as much light in, or twice as much light in as you go slower. Okay, go and practice it, play around in your own camera, you'll see just what I mean. So let me try and describe to you the effect that different shutter speeds have on the image, the creative effect, if you will. Uh, all I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate using this tennis ball, okay? I'm simply going to drop it onto the table and photograph it at different speeds, okay? Important point, this is obviously just regular household object, and all I'm doing is dropping it. I'm not throwing it, this isn't a fast-moving racing car, this isn't a sprinter doing 100 metres, this is just a lightweight tennis ball being affected by gravity. Okay, so our first shot, we're gonna shoot at half a second. Okay, can you see that? Now that's half a second, which in human terms we think of as not a very long period of time. As you can see, there's quite a lot of blur on there. In fact, you'd struggle to make out that as being a tennis ball at all. Now let's speed things up. Let's take a slightly faster shutter speed. Let's go to an eighth of a second. Here we go again. Still pretty blurry, isn't it? Still not really capturing motion. Let's try again with a thirtieth of a second. Now this really should be fast, shouldn't it? One thirtieth of a second, that's a tiny amount of time. Still pretty blurry. Once more at one one hundred and twenty-fifth of a second. Now we're getting somewhere. We can actually see the shape of the tennis ball much, much clearer. But we have to go all the way to one five hundredth of a second to actually freeze that tennis ball in motion. Okay, now not only does this demonstrate just how fast you have to go to actually freeze even decent motion like this, let alone you know, a racing car going around a corner at high speed or a sprinter, but it fundamentally demonstrates to you the differences in shutter speed. So a slow shutter speed, like half a second, will blur any motion in the shot, and a short shutter speed, like one five hundredth of a second, will freeze more motion. Okay, but the amount it freezes will vary from motion to motion. Some things you may need to go all the way to a faster shutter, shutter speed, and even then you might not be able to freeze them. But as a rule, if you're trying to freeze motion, you want a nice short shutter speed. And if you want to show off that motion for some reason, you want a slow shutter speed. There's one more thing to bear in mind regarding shutter speed and movement, and that's your own movement. If you're shooting handheld, you, you know, you're not resting the camera on a tripod or other sort of support, then there's a point with shutter speed below which your own movement will start to affect the image. The slower the shutter speed, the more this is exaggerated. And it's caused by the fact that you're not holding the camera anywhere near as solidly as you think you are, and the fact that the shutter is moving over a long period of time, comparatively, causes the camera to shake. 
In fact, that's what the phenomenon's called, camera shake. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Now, I'm going to be covering this in much more detail later on when I talk about focusing, but here's a very quick example of what it does. Have a look at these two images, which are both blurred. Now, in this image, there is actually some of the shot that's in focus, if you look at the bellows towards the back of the camera. That's because the blur in this shot is caused by simply focusing on the wrong part of the frame. In this image, however, nothing is in sharp focus, as the blur is caused by camera shake. The blur is universal across the frame. The best way I can find to imagine this phenomenon is if you think of the light streaming in through the lens as you take the picture, and then the light almost drawing the image on your sensor, or film, if you're still using film, then if that sensor moves around, then that light will be drawing in a shaky way. So the more the camera is moving during the period in which the light is drawing on the sensor, the shakier and more blurry the image will be. So you want the sensor and the camera, by extension, to be nice and stable when you're shooting, or you want that period of time during which the light is coming through to be very, very brief, so there's very little chance for there to be any blur and any shaky drawing. Now the rule of thumb to get round this, and again we'll come onto this in more detail in a future video when I talk about focusing and focal length of lenses and things, is that you need to be using a shutter speed that is as fast as your focal length. I appreciate that sounds very confusing if we're just starting out. What it means is that Let's say you're using a 50mm lens, which is a standard lens on what's called full-frame cameras. You want a shutter speed at least 1 50th of a second, ideally faster. So ideally 60th, 125th of a second, 250th of a second. Any slower than that, and you're likely to incur some degree of camera shake. So remember, focal length matched to shutter speed. So with a 100mm lens, you want 100th of a second or faster, and so on and so on. Now, it's worth pointing out that nowadays, lots and lots of cameras and lenses have some form of image stabilization or vibration reduction in them. These are basically very clever computer-controlled gyroscopic devices that work mechanically to counteract the movement you make when you shake. They're fantastic things, and they can add anything up to two to three stops in terms of how slow a shutter speed you can use and still get a sharp image. But, really important thing to point out about them, I'm stating the obvious here, but it's often not mentioned when you read the manufacturer's bump about these things and they boast of their ability. Of course, the vibration reduction or image stabilization that is in your lens or in your camera can only affect your lens and your camera. There's no way it can somehow magically slow down something out there in the real world you're photographing. So yes, it might allow you to handhold at a slower shutter speed than you might otherwise be able to shoot and still get a sharp image. So it might allow you to handhold at, say, 1 15th of a second with a 50 millimeter lens. The problem is, if what you're photographing isn't staying still, that doesn't matter. It will still be blurred. You will still pick up the blurring movement of that thing, even with image stabilization on it. It's not a magic cure. It obviously can't affect something out there in the real world. Okay, think back to that tennis ball and how blurred that got, even at what seemed like quite fast shutter speeds. And you'll realize that, yep, image stabilization, vibration reduction, all of these things, they're very clever, but they don't cheat the basic physics of, if you want to freeze movement, you need a fast shutter speed. Right, that's that for shutter speed for now. Don't forget, it's tied to aperture and ISO. ISO we're going to cover next week, aperture was last week, so no matter what you might think about, oh yeah, I'll just pick the perfect shutter speed I want, you've got to bear in mind those two other factors. As you know by now, this is a weekly series of beginners, basics, technical fundamentals that I'm building week by week to an entire beginner's course. If you like what I'm putting out there, stick a like down below, uh, either come back every Friday afternoon and wait patiently for the video to appear, or of course subscribe to the channel and you'll get the notifications anyway. And if you've got a query about something, stick a comment below and I'll do my very best to answer it. All the best, see you next week.